We reported our new data and findings in the 40th European Society of Lymphology Congress in Genoa in 2014. We would like to take this opportunity to provide a presentation from the surgical point of view. Please share and enjoy our slideshow with your lymph friends. Why is it that for lymphedema patients who frequently experience cellulitis, we have recommended a surgical treatment that has been contraindicated until now? Today, I would like to discuss three different points. The first point comes from the fact that the lymph surgery we propose has advanced into an ultra-minimally invasive procedure. The second point comes from the fact that the procedure for lymphatic venous anastomosis using super microsurgery that we propose is a curative treatment. The third point comes from the fact that the treatment is in accordance with the medical evidence. I will elaborate further later, but the frequency of occurrence of cellulitis can be kept to as low as about one-eighth. Said to occur in about 30% of lymphedema patients, cellulitis has become a major problem for society. Unlike with cellulitis that occurs in healthy people, cases of lymphedema with immune dysfunction can experience sudden redness at the edema area and develop a fever that progresses quickly and within a matter of a few hours can approach 40 degrees Celsius. In circumstances where cellulitis has emerged, the medical condition will continue to deteriorate where even conservative therapy cannot be performed. Because inpatient treatment lasting several weeks is needed at times, it can be difficult to continue with work. Intensive care for septic shock can cost upwards of $2 million. A 54-year-old woman, she had undergone cervical cancer surgery 16 years earlier. Her chief complaints were three or four attacks of cellulitis each year, accompanied by a 40-degree fever, as well as unsightly lymphorrhea exceeding 400 to 600 cc a day. She had tried conservative treatments in various medical institutions, but she repeatedly found that the conservative treatments themselves had triggered the outbreak of cellulitis and forced an interruption in treatment. Gradually, she stopped leaving her home even, developing depressive symptoms and experiencing suicidal ideation when she visited our hospital. We performed lymphocentigraphy and ICG lymphography to assess her lymphatic function. The results showed that the lower limb lymph flow had stasis in the inguinal area, and yet she had retained good lymphatic function. Based also on prior events, we decided on a treatment protocol that prioritizes surgical treatment. By using lymphocentigraphy, ICG lymphangiography, ultrasonography, and non-contact vein visualization devices to identify the lymph vessels and subcutaneous veins before surgery, we are able to create a lymph map and vein map in the affected area. We aim for where the lymph vessels and veins approach or intersect one another and decide on multiple places for skin incision sites. The significance of implement bypasses at multiple locations is that there are also reports that the anastomotic patency rate, several years later, is about 35%, so we perform anastomosis at multiple locations with purpose of making assurances. Performing these detailed preoperative examinations increases surgical accuracy as well, and skin incisions can be performed at 1 to 2 centimeters, allowing for surgery to be conducted under local anesthesia. We have even been able to perform it on patients aged 90 and older. Here I will show you Dr. Hada's LVA video. After the skin incision sites are determined by the previously described method before surgery, the procedure is performed under local anesthesia. The white object appearing here is the surgeon's index finger. The skin incisions are 1 to 2 centimeters. We find the collecting lymphatic vessel from the subcutaneous fat. It is this white transparent lymph vessel. Next, we seek out the subcutaneous vein. Using a surgical microscope, we anastomose about 0.5 millimeters of lymphatic vessel and vein with 12-0 nylon thread. 
When four or five stitches are made, the anastomosis is complete. After anastomosis, we make sure that the lymph flow is flowing properly into the vein. The influx of lymph causes the red vein to change color to white. We then conclude surgery by closing the wound. The internal pressure of lymph vessels after lymph node dissection is said to rise to 50 millimeters of mercury and higher. By contrast, the internal pressure of normal subcutaneous veins is 10 millimeters of mercury and below. Directly anastomosing a lymphatic vessel and vein together produces a pressure gradient between the lymphatic vessel inner pressure and the venous pressure, and a lymphatic vessel with abnormally elevated internal pressure can be lowered to close to the venous pressure. Now I will describe our hospital's standard treatment protocol. After lymphedema is first definitively diagnosed by lymphocentigraphy and ICG lymphangiography, patients start to wear high compression stockings. Later, cases that still have lymphatic function undergo LVA. For cases where favorably bypass root formation can be confirmed intraoperatively, we ultimately propose one or two hospital visits a year, or changing to medium compression or low compression stockings, along with ongoing observation of edema findings, and in some cases, doing without stockings altogether. Depending on the state, they are able to travel and engage in sports without problems too. This is an analysis of our 95 LVA cases. This study was reported through the August 2014 British Journal of Surgery. The data relates to 11 cases of upper limb lymphedema and 84 cases of lower limb lymphedema. Overall, the mean preoperative annual frequency of occurrence was 1.46, but it drops to as low as 0.18. Now I'll report on the course of treatment for the previously mentioned case. First, we improved her state of edema with low compression bandages not to induce cellulitis, and later we twice performed lymphatic venous anastomosis under local anesthesia with the goal of preventing the onset of cellulitis. Later, upon confirming that the edema had improved and cellulitis was not occurring, we shifted to wearing of high compression bandages. No occurrence of cellulitis was noted after surgery and her edema also improved rapidly. Her knee shrank in circumference by 20 centimeters or more, and her lymphorrhea disappeared, with absolutely no cellulitis showing up. Now she attends dance school every week and enjoys a busy life filled with travel, shopping, and visits to hot springs. Here I'm showing you results by staging of the lymphedema. As the staging progresses, the frequency of occurrence of cellulitis rises, but the occurrence of cellulitis has been prevented even in severe stages, so long as even a little lymphatic function remains. At stage 3, the mean annual frequency of occurrence is four times, whereas after surgery it drops to about one-sixth at 0.62 times. Here we can see the results with and without radiation therapy. The group that underwent radiation therapy was found to have a significant rise in the frequency of occurrence of cellulitis. Our procedure forms a bypass route outside the range of irradiation, so it can still lower the frequency of occurrence of cellulitis in cases that have a prior history of irradiation. However, this is not to say that it has an effect in all cases, and cases of idiopathic lymphedema due to lymphatic hypoplasia have total disappearance of the function of the lymphatic vessels to be anastomosed with no observed improvement. Now I have given you the reasons why we have proposed a surgical treatment. At the current stage, we can assert that lymphatic venous anastomosis using supermicrosurgery technique is one of the best options of treatment. Here is a message from us to younger lymph therapists. Change your mindset. Whether conservative therapy is better or surgical treatment is better, this kind of discussion is already nonsense. I think that fusing these two different approaches to treatment will be the next generation of lymphedema therapy. Thank you for your attention.